<laughs> Glad to have you all here. Um, we, uh, before we sing, we do have a birthday to sing. But before we do that, I just want to just give you, um, to make you all aware of the fact that I'm going to be gone next Sunday. My wife and I are taking a, a long delayed honeymoon weekend away. It's going to take us 12 years to get there. Uh, would encourage the rest of you to have honeymoons sooner than that. Uh, so Sean's going to be preaching for me uh, next Sunday. Thank you, Sean. Um, and also, uh, we're having a new members class on the 15th and the 22nd at 9 o'clock in the parish house. So Sean and I will be teaching that during Sunday school. Brian is going to be covering the Sunday school class for the next three Sundays. But again, everyone is welcome. Uh, if, if you have any questions, you can see me or you can see Brian. <laughs> Um, and uh, anyway, uh, also, just to get put it in your calendar, on the 22nd of October, we're going to have the wonderful uh, opportunity to have one of our missionaries with us. So, John Myers, the Myers family in Papua New Guinea, they're on furlough, and so he is going to be coming and sharing an update of their mission uh, that they've been a part of now for um, a number of years. We've been privilege to be a part of their mission from its very inception, right? So we were a part of those that sent them over to Papua New Guinea to begin with. Um, and I know I've shared this my, uh, before, but it was such a uh, shot to the arm, hit to the arm, really, uh, encouragement to me, because here they were a young family with a couple of little kids. Not going to Europe, going to the heartland of Papua New Guinea, mm -hmm. and just trusting the Lord. Mm -hmm. And it's been really cool, and the Lord has blessed their faithfulness and ministry. There is now a Kaje church mm -hmm. that is now reaching out to the uh, to other uh, villages and tribes, mm -hmm. uh, where there wasn't one before. And, and we have been blessed and privileged to be a part of that from the ground up. And so that's really cool. I want, so some of you who are newer and haven't been a part of that history, that is part of the history. So when, when he comes, it's not just some missionary, it's it's somebody that, that, I mean, I remember when he first walked in the door and said, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. So you, you know, and, and we as a church, we had never supported any foreign missionaries at that point, and we said, we're going to do this, and we started committing, and we've built uh, our missions from there, but, you know, this is really cool to see what the Lord has done in, I mean, it's 12 short years, so pretty cool. Anyway, I'm rambling on, now it's time to sing, right? Les Cowan, sitting in the back there, is going to be 80 years old this Wednesday. So, we need to sing in a rousing rendition of that. You've heard it a less.
Any uh, uh, yes, Beth? Um, it's just quickly budget subcommittee meeting. I think over in the parish house after get a plate of food and going over. Excellent. So if you are on that subcommittee, grab a plate of food and screw it on over. Excellent. Awesome. Very good. The same He's not here. Uh, um, then, then no, I don't think he will. <laughs> <laughs>
offer you, and so we, we offer to you ourselves. We offer to you our lives. We offer to you our hearts. We offer to you our affections, our allegiance, our devotion, and even the struggles in those things. We offer them to you because you are worthy. And we come once again this morning to focus especially a, a, upon that attention that you are the Lamb of God who has taken away our sin, the sin of the world. We are of the world, but no longer, because you have redeemed us. And we are so very grateful. Even as we take this service today and we focus intently and entirely on what you did for us on the cross, may this be truly a, a rejuvenating for us, a time for us in the faith as we walk forward closely to, closer to you and always in the wonder of and the gratitude and the awe for what you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh, you may be seated. If I could call the kids forward, um, we will continue in our praise together.
self-sufficient and we don't need, really need you all that much. Except when, you know, maybe we're in a bad scrape or things are looking desperate and it's outside of what we might think we can control or handle. But that's just us lying to ourselves. And this is truth that's being brought back to bear to us, even as we come into your house, the house you beckon us to come to as the house of prayer for all peoples. We are here to do that, to acknowledge that no, uh, every day and every hour, we need you for everything. And so even as we come in prayer, we want to come acknowledging that you are that one for us. You are our God. And we love you. We want you. And we need you. So let us, oh, I just want to just open it up for prayer for anyone else to voice something before you. Thank you, God, for, for being a sovereign God and, and giving us a foundation that we can stand on when the winds of this world can push us around and we have sure feet. And thank you, God, for being a God that is worthy of praise and still loves us anyways. Lord, I think that, thank you that we can come to you with all our needs, that you're a wonderful, gracious Father. Um, I ask that you look over Hank and help him to get better quickly um, through this cough or whatever he has. Also, um, that you watch over our new grandson, Elliot, each and every day. I haven't been anywhere to meet him yet because of Hank being sick. So we're hopefully next weekend. And Lord, I ask that you watch over um, my entire family, this church as my family, and health-wise, um, anyone that's sick or ailing. Please help control their pain, help Colleen as she gets stronger, protect Frank, that he doesn't worry so much, and for his health also. But um, for all of the unknown, unseen ailments that we all have. Please, Lord, help us to be able to tolerate them and help us to be able to grow closer to you through them, through those challenges. Thank you, Lord. Dear Lord, I just thank you. I just thank you for being someone that we can count on and somebody who comes through for us. God, you know the struggle that are happening right now in my life, God, just, I thank you that I made it this morning. Mm -hmm. um, it's, the struggle is real, but I thank you that I keep trying and I keep coming. Lord, I pray for my family um, as we've lost um, one of the uh, strong figures in our family, my uncle, my God, I, I know he's there with you, but those who remain, God, please, just provide comfort for them, Lord. And God, I just pray for everyone in this church that you will just come alongside us. There are people who are suffering, God. There are people who are not as, I don't know, broken as I am, that just can't just pour it out and just say, God, I am just, I just need you every day, every second. Um, I mess it up every day. But I just thank you that I keep coming back. I thank you for giving me a husband who is forgiving and loving, a son who's forgiving and loving, and to know that I'm loved with all the shortcomings that I see so, so, so big in front of me, but with you, they're nothing, and as long as you're there, I'm going to make it, and I just thank you for that, God, and just, if anyone here needs to hear it, he's here for us, and we don't need to be perfect, we just need to show up. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Lord, I pray for your blessing over Sharon's class for the homeschool kids that starts this week. Yes. I pray, Lord, that um, as she teaches them to write and communicate and to understand what they read, that your purposes will be served in the lives of those children by that. Yes. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for our community out here and that, that uh, Next weekend, there's there's a farm tour that's an opportunity for, for people to stray in, onto this long mm -hmm. peninsula, mm -hmm. and perhaps they might might see this church building, mm -hmm. or perhaps we'll be at the farm tour and might be able to shed light and share light and grace with others. We just ask that you would help us as individuals and as a as a congregation to 
to uh, love you and for that to spill out into our lives. Mm -hmm. Dear Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful body of Christ that um, you have allowed to come together at Long Branch Church. And uh, we praise you for what you are doing in just so many amazing ways, blessing us uh, with a wonderful teaching, Lord, that is um, checked carefully by your by your scriptures, Lord. Um, we thank you for each each heart that submits to you, Lord. And we know too that as good things come, it's easy to get our eyes off of you. And um, Lord, difficult things come along, and they allow us to grow in you more, Lord. Um, we would ask that you would give us unity of vision, unity um, to seek your will in everything here. Just help us to submit as, as we each need to, Lord. Um, I thank you so much for Kathy and that she's starting this new job, Lord. Um, please go before and um, prepare Hank and Abby um, for the changes and um, for Kathy as it will be an amazing ministry opportunity, Lord. Um, just really fill her with your presence, with your word, um, with your hope that she can bring to these to these folks that she will be serving. Mm -hmm. And also for Daryl, as um, Sandy has requested, mm -hmm. um, that we pray for her dear sweet husband. Um, what a <coughs> what a long and wonderful journey you have brought them down together um, and we as she is concerned about just the suffering that he's going through right now um, and i know that they're pursuing whatever medical uh, possibilities are there for the relief of his suffering and just for a renewal of health and strength lord um, and yet even as she brought the request this morning and during sunday school she she asked that we pray um, more specifically for a deeper healing, that is one that is able to walk through these sufferings with a deeper hope and, and joy in the Lord. And, and, uh, and so we ask for that. We would ask also that you would relieve his sufferings. Um, we would ask that you give the doctors a uh, sense of wisdom in being able to diagnose and be able to prescribe what might be needed to to give him uh, just some physical respite. Yes. Um, but even in that too, Lord, we pray that you would just deepen his hope and trust and joy in you, um, that he might be able to walk forward into whatever it is he must face from your providential hand um, with that deeper uh, life of Christ just gurgling through his being. Yes. Um, and then also as Sandy asked, and as it is something that we've had to face and will have to face. She's, she asked that we pray that we all die well, mm -hmm. right? And it's one thing to live for the Lord. It's also another thing to contemplate dying for the Lord and that you would prepare each of us as we walk this journey because we don't know when that end point may be. As we get older, we see it closer and more clearly but for all of us lord we want to live well for you and we also want to as you guide and provide we want to die well in you and so we have to really just instill that in us as well in jesus name lord i thank you that you are sovereign over all things that you have planned nothing happens apart from your will, Lord, and so as believers, it doesn't matter what's going on around us. You're allowing it to happen, you're choosing it to happen, Lord, and we get to rest in that. Lord, every time we come to pray, I get overwhelmed at you sure the veil, Lord, that we can enter into your presence, and that we get to pray to God Almighty, part of the Red Sea, who made the earth, who created us, Lord, and that 
Jesus intercedes for us, Lord. And I just am so thankful for that, Lord. And I thank you for the cross. I'm reminded, Lord, that we get so bogged down in life, Lord, but we should be jumping for joy every day because you saved a wretch like us. Like me, Lord. You saved us and you died for me, Lord. And you took my place, Lord. And so I pray, Lord, that that joy would always be in our hearts no matter what is going on around us, Lord, that you saved us. That we are set free because of you, Lord, and we just thank you for that. And Lord, you are, you deserve all honor and praise. You are almighty. You are holy, holy, holy. And we pray, Lord, that you would just fill our hearts with praise, Lord, to the best of our ability, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, I lift up Freya to you today. She's come to mind this morning. Um, and lots of the people here know Freya. When she has gone somewhere with her father who doesn't have a home and doesn't have a job, but Lord, um, I know that she learned about you. She learned about mm-hmm. Jesus, her friend, while she was here. So I ask you to help her to mm-hmm. look towards Jesus, wherever she is, and keep her safe. Thank you. close together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Call forward the ushers at this time to receive the offer. <laughs>
a whole different uh, section of the Lord's Word, but one that really focuses on the centrality, the necessity, and the preeminence of Christ and what that mean, needs to mean in our lives. And so that's kind of where we're going to go next. Uh, but right now we're going to be looking at one of the most classic um, communion sections of passages of the scripture that kind of outlines to us what we do here in this moment and why. Right? So please turn in your scriptures to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll be looking at verses 17 through 34. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink, this, drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. Well, on our coinage, we read the motto, E Pluralis Uno, out of the many, one. In our Pledge of Allegiance, we recite, one nation under God, indivisible. And that indeed is the American ideal that in all our various differences, you know, from the past and into the present, different origins, different opinions, etc. We unite around a common core that is the Constitution. Much like what we do here at the Long Branch Church, keeping many things secondary while, while keeping the central things central. But what we have found over the years in our land that we love, and most recently especially, is the increasing Fractionaliza fractionalization of this unity and this core particularly manifested in the increased political polarization accompanied by overt madness and meanness and mistrust. When we think of our current societal situation, something is desperately wrong in the place where it should be Right, right here in America, right? City on the hill, bastion of freedom, land of the free, home of the brave, can it be so again? Something is desperately wrong. The divisiveness makes it known. So it is here in our passage as well. The language is very strong. Something is desperately wrong. 
Now, just so you know, um, it's been a while since we walked through this particular book, but if, if you were here and you remember, or if you read through it recently, you know. <laughs> if there ever was a troubled church in the history of the world, it was the church in Corinth. If there ever was a divided church in the history of the world, it was this church in Corinth. And yet this was Christ's church. And, and this was still Paul's baby, so to speak. And so the Lord, through the Apostle Paul, sought to steer that infant church along in the right way. To show it once again the basics of the Christian life and faith. Here it is the basics of communion or as Paul calls it, the Lord's Supper. Yes, something is desperately wrong, where of all places it should be right. This place, in this place. Just like us, it is so easy to take things for granted, to slip into some comfortable routine, but they have forgotten the basics. So too, as we come to this holy moment once again, as we're about to partake of this Lord's Supper, let us pause and be reminded as the Apostle Paul unwraps for us the basics of communion, and they are very basic indeed. Number one, communion is central. Number two, communion is special. All right, if we can keep a good hold on both of those two things, we will have a good hold in. What do I say and why do I say it? Communion is central. It is central to our worship and to our unity. Let me unpack that a bit. It is central to our worship. Why do I say this? Hopefully you noticed as I read our way through, because I inflected things intentionally. Five times in this passage we find the repetition of when you Come together. Verses 17, 18, and 20 on the front end. And then again, verses 33 and 34 on the back end. It's what frames the whole discussion. It's what I've called a literary sandwich, right? It's the bread on both sides with the meat of Holy Communion in the middle. But two times in particular, it makes this explicit qualification. Verse 18, when you come together together, as a church, and in verse 20, when you come together and it talks about them eating or, 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 or not actually or rightly eating the Lord's Supper. But what this means is the issue of the Lord's Supper concerns the gathered assembly of believers, the church. And when the earliest churches gathered, they gathered for communion. It was part of their frequent and regular practice, and rightly so, for this is the center of our identity. It is the repetition of the gospel to us, to each other, and to the world. And so whenever there is a self-identified Christian church, there must be the regular observance of the Lord's Supper of Communion. Because it is, and has always been, central to our worship. And it is central to our unity. There are many disagreements among Christians about how communion is to be practiced. Or even what all is going on here, right? From the Roman Catholics on one side, uh, to the Baptists on the other. And sadly, it has been a perennial issue of division between Christians instead of a celebration of our unity. But nothing's new. It was the same then. They divided at the place and symbol of our unity, just like we so easily do. And, and here I'm not talking about how we so easily misunderstand the scriptures and misunderstand each other. But rather, and it's revealed as the issue here, because we're all sinners, naturally bent toward pride and prejudice and selfishness. Notice especially verse 18 once again. When you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. 
And their divisions were divisions based primarily on class, on socioeconomic status. Just to unwrap things a little bit, in the earliest days of the church, that is, before church became both legal and respectable, um, worship was usually held in homes. Naturally, for a sizable gathering, you'd gravitate toward the richest Christian with the biggest house. Also, the Lord's Supper was still joined as part of an actual meal that they shared together, kind of like uh, our fellowship time after the service, right? However, in a typical home of that day, and it's not too unlike our own, the dining room only held a small number for a select few, and all the rest would have to be accommodated in the courtyard, what might correspond to our living room. The problem is that this quickly became a partition between the haves and the have-nots. For they had in their church, and in their churches, both the wealthy and the dirt poor, both the landowners and slaves, participating together in worship, and some of them carried that class into church practically ignoring or looking down on the less fortunate, closely associating with their own kind, eating sumptuously with your in-group while others had little to nothing. For us, we naturally and wrongly tend to divide our churches between rich and poor, black and white, personal temperament and political affiliation, etc., but even within our churches, there is a general preference given to the successful, the, the beautiful, and the popular. Don't believe me? Mm. And the others are too often set aside. But when the Apostle Paul looked at this situation, he was not okay with it. Such a division at the remembrance meal of Christ's sacrificial love destroyed the very essence of the supper, the very message of the gospel. They may have had their theology all right, but what they were doing made the sacrament cease to be, in fact, the Lord's Supper, verse 20. And this is what we need to remember as well. So a couple of keys to keep with you in your pocket. Firstly, the cross is what unites us as believers. We all agree with this in principle, don't we? But do we do so in practice? I mean, if you look out more broadly, we tend to unite churches, right, around denominational creeds and behavioral codes. Um, I, I won't get into specifics. I can go on a rap trail. I won't. When it should simply be the cross. Now, I will say this. And I've mentioned it before, but this is one of the things I'm grateful for about y'all here in Long Beach. Y'all, that's right. I did spend some time in the South, y'all. There's y'all, that's singular. Well, it depends on what part of the South. And then there's all y'all. But I digress. I thought when I first went moved to the South, I thought, this is brilliant. You now can tell if you're speaking about you singular or you plural, because you is always going to be singular, and y'all will always be plural. And then I got it all messed up when somebody said, no, no, y'all is, is singular. All y'all is plural. So at like that point, I just, I just gave up. All right. Okay, but one of, the, um, one of the special parts of our history and identity here at this church, at least in the past decade or so, has been its insistence upon uniting around the cross, right, and allowing for differences of opinion and background on a whole host of other matters, not as unimportant, but as secondary, right? That what the scriptures keep is central, so shall we. And there's nothing more central than the cross. Let us never forget that. That's right. And secondly, the remembrance of the cross Communion is what is to unite us as a church. This is where they got into trouble. They were dividing the church at the place that unites it. 
And this is where we too often get into trouble as well. I mean, speaking generally again, we tend to have our uh, in-groups at our shun groups. We have certain people we associate with that we, that we talk to and spend time with and uh, others that we talk bad about or look down on or just simply dismiss or ignore. Too often we come not just to church but even to communion holding grudges or nursing bitterness and we leave this place in the same status quo. But this table is the place of our unity and must express our unity. Okay, summarily then, anything that distracts from our bond of unity, the cross, or that divides us at our bond of community, communion, is a travesty. It needs to be, that needs to be shot. Strikes at the heart of what is truly a Christian faith. Okay, so communion, I told you this was going to be a shorter sermon, didn't I? I didn't? Oh, darn, I should have. It would have given you all hope. That's all of point one, and there's only two points. Second, communion is special, right? So I'm using simple words to express profound truths. But I'm using simple words on purpose, because I think we can all, doesn't matter what age we are, we can all grasp something that's central and something that's special. Now, we can unwrap what that is, but if you can just keep the simplicity of it, and it's easy to do, communion is central, communion is now special, it is special because it is the remembrance of the cross, and it is the proclamation of the cross, okay, so let's look at how it's special because it's the remembrance of the cross, and I want to just hone in on verses 23 to 25, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now you hear that repetition, right? Do this in remembrance of me. Of me, And it is important for us to hear that and understand what this means, right? Because it's not just mental and passive. And I've served long enough as a pastor in uh, differently flavored churches, long enough to know that this is a trap we easily fall into. And we think of do this in remembrance of me as we just sit there and we have our own special individual holy moment in my head. That's not at all what the scriptures mean when they're talking about this. It's not mental and passive. It's an activity. It's something I do because in the Old Testament, think about it. When God remembers his people, he delivers them. When he remembers our sins no more, he does not hold them against us. When Israel was to remember that they were slaves in Egypt but no longer, it was through their great worship feasts. So your mind is engaged, absolutely. But so is the rest of you. Right? So here, this is the necessary and regular rehearsal of the gospel in and through our lives. It is a tangible reminder of what Jesus did for us on the cross. In it, I remember his death for me. And I need that. We all need that. To come over and over, reminded both that I am a sinner and that I have. So, the second aspect leading into it, it's special because it is the proclamation of the cross. He says that when we do this in remembrance of me, uh, 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 okay, I'm okay. verse 26, we proclaim the Lord's death. And we proclaim it at two levels and two directions. First, we proclaim it into our own lives because whenever we, okay, and we're going to do it momentarily, Partake of these elements of bread and the cup. 
We are proclaiming the gospel once again to ourselves. For we are confessing that we are sinners in need of a Savior and that Jesus is that Savior for sinners. More than that, as I eat his body and drink his blood, and that is a graphic and deeply spiritual symbolism. Okay, you guys can run with that however you want. When I eat this bread and drink this cup, when I eat his body and drink his blood, his death instead of mine, his death becoming mine, his death giving me life, his death feeding my life. As I eat and drink, he is my Savior. It is very personal. It is very tangible proclamation. So that's inward. Secondly, we proclaim it as a church before the world. I mean, this is where it becomes even more visible because how we as brothers and sisters eat at this table is either a proclamation for the cross or it is a proclamation against it, which is where the, the warnings come in the verses that follow. We're not going to really touch on them much other than just for you to notice them. For the Corinthian Christians, how they were proclaiming against the cross, look at verse 22. What? <laughs> and Paul is a guest. Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. In not fully including, right? In not fully sharing of themselves and their food, they were humiliating those who were lower on society's ladder, and in so doing, they were actually despising the church of God. That's God's verdict. But the same thing comes back to us as well. If you come to church, and, and especially to the table, and yet you carry a hockey or divisive spirit in your heart, in your words, in your actions, then you are in fact making an active proclamation. But it's an active proclamation against that very cross. And the world and our children easily spot and smell that kind of hypocrisy. It simply becomes empty religion. And Jesus that. But there is more. Right? It's not only in two directions, inwardly and outwardly. It's also in two tenses. Right? Past and future. Because the cross isn't an end point. The cross is the fulcrum of a larger and open-ended event. It says, verse 26, we proclaim the Lord's Death, full stop? No. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, right? So that means that the cross is, is an empty cross. It means that the tomb is an empty tomb. It means that our Lord is a living Lord and a returning Lord. And that radically changes my life. That radically changes the character of this moment. Because this is not simply a solemn moment to remember a fallen hero. Right? Like a sanctified moment of silence. No, it is solemn, yes. Because of what he took for me. But it is a solemn celebration and anticipation or expectation as well. Okay, so how, how should we come to this table? I've expressed it years and years ago. I'll state it simply once again as the ABCs of communion. Right? And so this is just, again, to, to simply remember things in their simplicity. A, ask for forgiveness. Right? For the cross is his death for my Sins. And so every time we come, it's good to acknowledge that. Ask for forgiveness. A. B. Be sure that 
kind of Christian, right? That he truly is my Savior, not in name, but from the heart. And then C, commit to a renewed life of love and obedience. This is the part, maybe they're kind of, well, each of those can kind of hit us at different levels. But, and each one is important, the A, the B, and the C. Because if he is my Savior, then he is my Lord. Which includes, again, coming into this passage again, how I treat those who serve that same Lord with humility and forgiveness as equals, as family, like we see in the opening and close of this section. So, very basic indeed. You guys are going, wait, he's done? <laughs> very basic. I, hey, don't get used to it. Like I said, <laughs> the next one is going to be even longer. Well, last, uh, the last Sunday's message was really long. It'll probably be comfortable. Right, let's just put it that way. Very basic indeed, but too often lost. But how central and special is this table to you? According to the scriptures, the Lord's Supper is the central event of the Christian life and the Christian community. It is the perpetual and tangible reminder of who saved us and what unites us. As such, it is also a uniquely special event. It is special to God. It needs to be special to us. It is not an empty ritual. It is not a magic pill. And it is not a little snack. Just like give us this day our daily bread as we voice in the Lord's Prayer, it is a necessary and regular meal for both body and soul. But it is serious business. It bears the personal promise of pardon in life. It also places demands upon my life that I act in accordance with the truth of the gospel in a way that shows that I have truly received it. Right? For grace received is grace lived. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. And for your word that brings to us how very central and special this moment is. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to be our savior on that cross. To be our savior, not only, but also our Lord, because he has bought us with a price. He bought us with the greatest price of all his own blood. And so even now as we contemplate anew what you have done for us, we pray that, and as we take of this bread and cup, and we ingest it into our beings. May you renew us, both in mind, spirit, body, and soul, into the truth of that, that we would truly walk forward in it. And if there is anyone here today who has not truly come to that moment, the ABCs, right? Even as we reflect in song, and even as we begin to partake, allow your spirit to be drawn after him. And then as it says, examine yourself and so eat. It doesn't matter if you are worthy or not. We're all unworthy. He is worthy. And so come after him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please look in your uh, insert. There's a hymn that's not in our hymnal, but it's one that's very precious to me. Jesus, thou joy of loving hearts, let us stand together.
practice that this morning. We're going to just take a few minutes now in silence. Open your heart before the Lord. Confess your sins before Him. We know we, know we all have, have it. And we know that He knows our hearts. So let's just be honest with Him. If you want a Savior, you can have Him. Just come. He offers Himself to you. Thank you, O Lord, for the promise you give us in your scriptures that if we confess our sins, you are faithful, you are just, you will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we're so very grateful for that. We want to acknowledge um, both that we need you and we are so thankful that you have done that for us. We also want to thank you for giving to us this remembrance of what you've done because we need to be reminded and reminded not just in our minds but in our souls and our beings. We thank you for these tangible things, this, this bread and this cup by which we are able to touch more closely the meaning of this moment. And even as we do so again, Lord, we pray that you touch each and every heart that is here to be drawn closer to you because of what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, as he was about to go to that cross for us, he took simple bread and he broke it and he gave it to, to his disciples as I am ministering in his name. Give this bread to you.
also after that last supper with his disciples, he offered them the cup. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you 